791, if you'll open your songbook there. 791. Brother Ricky's going to lead us in that song, and Alan, if you'll word our prayer for us afterwards. Hear the voice of Jesus say, loudly crying unto all, in my vineyard work today, hearken to his call. Work then for Jesus, he will own and bless your labors. Work, work for Jesus, work, work today. Through the long and toilsome day, neath the blazing burning sun, bear the in heaven we thank you for this day and we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us and father we thank you for this hour that you've given to us and allowed us to gather together to study from your word and we pray father that you'll be with tony during this time and help him have a, a good recollection of those things that he's prepared and we pray father as students of the hour that we'll open our minds and we'll open our hearts as we open our bibles and we study together and we pray father that those things tonight will help strengthen us in your word that help us in our understanding, and especially so that we have opportunity to explain and to teach others about the gospel of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to continue in our study of the various churches. And if you'll remember last week, what I attempted to do was to uh, do an introduction to try to be able to explain a lot of what the Bible teaches about the true church. And uh, last week's lesson, I was trying to cover four things, and I got through part of the first one. Uh, we talked about what is your origin in history, how are you organized, what must I do to be saved, and how do you worship? And I mentioned to you that in teaching this class previously, that many times people would say to me, why don't you take the Lord's Church and talk about it first? And uh, so that's what I've decided to do. And last week we covered that first part. We talked about Jesus' plan to build his church, Matthew 16, verses 16 through 19. We talked about it being established during the days of those people who were alive then, Luke chapter 9, verse 27. We talked about the church going through a period of apostasy, that it was prophesied both in Paul's letter to Timothy and his letter to the Thessalonians, he told them that there would be a falling away. We also discussed the fact that some suggest that the Lord's Church was a result of what's called the American Restoration Movement. And uh, there were people who said that Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell started the Churches of Christ. And in fact, I've listened to at least three or four YouTube videos today where people said that's what happened. That's the way it is. In fact, if you go to a look at a Wikipedia article, that's going to tell you the same thing. The problem was is that you have to go back and look and see what happened. And uh, I've almost felt like I needed to back up and teach a little bit of church history before I teach the denominations, but uh, I'll just explain that as we go. But the Catholic Church split in 1054 A.D. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox refused to accept the Bishop of Rome as being the head of the church, and so you have the Eastern Orthodox. Well, what happened around the 1500 was there were a lot of people who looked and saw that the 
Catholic Church was involved in a lot of immoral things. One of them was the sale of indulgences. And uh, the sale of indulgences was you could go and pay the priest for some of your family member who had already died, and they wouldn't have to suffer as much punishment in eternity. In other words, if you did something real bad, and then you could say, okay, well, my grandfather, he was a moonshiner. I'm just exaggerating. He, he was a bad man. He did all this stuff. And so I've come into some money, and I want to go and pay. And so the sale of indulgences was something that was just considered to be reprehensible. And uh, things had become very immoral. And so a man by the name of Martin Luther went to the Wittenberg Castle and he nailed on the front door there of that church building 95 things that he said was wrong. Well, that's a lot. And what that did, that ushered in what was called the Reformation Movement, where there were people trying to reform the Catholic Church. And uh, not only were they trying to do that, you also have Henry VIII, who was the king of England, who wanted to marry another woman, and the church wouldn't approve of it, so he started the Anglican Church. And we'll talk about that more later. But what happens is about 300, 250 years later, there were a group of men who said, that's the wrong approach. What we need to do is go back and to find the original pattern. We need to go back and do Bible things and Bible ways. And among those men were men like Thomas and Alexander Campbell and Martin Stone and Raccoon John Smith and some other names I could spend time with. But those men were a part of what was called the Restoration Movement. And it's like Jeremiah 6 and verse 16 says, ask for the old way, wherein, or ask for the old paths, wherein is a good way, and walk therein, and you'll find rest for your souls. God's plan is always to go back to where you were right with God, and that was called restoration. But Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell could not have started the Churches of Christ. And I try to point out that they're too late. The Campbells immigrated from Ireland in the 1800s, the early 1800s, 1807 for Thomas and then uh, 1809. After they got it, when they got here, they were Presbyterians, but they had joined the Baptist in 1813. And they continued from 1813 to 1823 when Alexander Campbell started editing the Christian Baptist. That was his publication. They separated from the Baptist somewhere between 1827 and 1830. And then in 1830, he started publishing the Millennial Harbinger. Now, uh, you can say, well, uh, what's the significance of that? Well, you can go to old Philadelphia out on Vervilla Road. That church building there dates to 1830. We know the church was there in 1805 with elders and we know what they were practicing because of the history that was there. So the Campbells are too late. But uh, the truth is, we don't even have to go there. We have to go back and say, you go back to the original pattern. And uh, Brother Alan Hires always uses what I think is an excellent illustration. Uh, today, baseball is very popular. But let's say in the next hundred years, baseball falls out of practice. And then somebody comes along two, three hundred years from now and says, Hey, I found this rule book here. The rule book says the regulation, rules and regulations for playing baseball. And so somebody goes out and they build a, a field and they put first base, second base, third base, home plate, and they get the number of players, they get the bat and the ball, and they do everything. What game are they playing? Baseball. But baseball hadn't been played for 200 years. But they're still doing what? They're playing baseball. Well, if a person takes the seed, which is the word of God, Luke 8 and verse 11, and he says, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. If you plant the seed in the heart of a good and honest person, what does it produce? Now, I don't know if y'all remember, not too long ago, I used an illustration of a date palm seed that was found in Israel. And that seed was back from the first century. And they took and they planted that seed and they grew a tree. And it started producing fruit. And the reason why they wanted to do that was because it had 
preceded a lot of the diseases and things that had come along. And, but you know what? You plant that same seed, did they expect to get something other than a date palm from it? No. Seed always produces after its kind. And so you ask the question, if you plant the seed in the heart, the seed's the word of God in the heart of a person today, what does it make? A Christian. That's all it will make, Christians only. And we know that according to Acts 2.47, that those who gladly received his word were baptized, and their Lord added to them they about 3,000 souls. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. If Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, verse 16, and a man does that, to what church does the Lord add him? His church, the only church. It's the church that belongs to him. And, uh, and of course, what we find in Acts 11, verse 26, Acts 26, verse 28, in 1 Peter 4, verse 16, all of them say Christian. And that's a perfect name because it's after the Lord who established his church. But there will always be departures and there will be restorations. And uh, the way I look at it is I look at the children of Israel in the Old Testament, particularly during the period of the judges. How did the children of Israel act during the Old Testament time? They'd be faithful to God, and then what would happen? Fall, fall away, they'd cry back to God, and they'd come back. And they'd fall away again, and they'd come back. And uh, that's what happens. Uh, churches go through difficult times, but uh, there will always be those. Now, the next part of our lesson is organization. And it's not uncommon today that when you start talking about religions, that you'll hear all kinds of religious offices. Uh, you may hear popes, cardinals, presidents, archbishops. Uh, you could just name a whole bunch of other things, general moderators, uh, you know, presiding bishop. Well, the Lord's church, the head of the church, is nobody here on earth. The head of the church, according to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 is, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning from the, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. When we recognize this is the Lord's church, we say the head of the Lord's church is Jesus, nobody else. And uh, then he himself designated some certain offices if you'll notice with me, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And notice the way that Paul phrases this. And he himself, pause there for just a second. He himself, why use that double there? Intensification is the way English teachers would put it. Why use that intensification? It's him and only him. You're, you're being emphatic. It's Jesus gave some to be apostles. Now, he pause right there. He gave some to be apostles. Who were those men who were chosen to be apostles? Apostles. They were men sent with the commission who were to be witnesses to him in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Witnesses. Now, that's a different term you hear people today use the term, well, I went and witnessed to him. No, you didn't. You went and tried to teach him. You can't witness Jesus. You know why? He's not here. You've not seen him. You've not heard him. You've not touched him. You remember what John said in John 1, verses 1 and following? That which we have seen with our eyes, that which our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. You're not like Thomas to put your hands in the nail prints and in his side. We can't witness because we're not eyewitnesses. So he gave some to be apostles, some prophets. Now, what was a prophet? A spokesman for God. God gave a revelation to men. For instance, in 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, 
For no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But I learned from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, that where there are prophecies, they will cease. So at the office of an apostle, the office of a prophet, were temporary offices. How do I know that? Jesus is not here for us to be a witness of him. Number two, the gift of prophecy was to be for that period of time, and once that ceased, then there was no need for that again. Some evangelist, who are those dudes? Those who herald the gospel, the good news. That's what evangelist means, a herald of good news. People who preach the message of the gospel. Now, if you read what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, after telling him to preach the word, he said, do the work of an evangelist. You know, make sure that you do that job. And some pastors and teachers. Now, when you see that, you know what people think of immediately when those little uh, antennas go up and you say pastors and teachers, you know what people think of? Think of preacher, but he's already mentioned evangelist. There are two places in the Bible where the emphasis is on what a pastor does. Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 17, he sends for the elders of the church. And when the elders arrive, he says to them in verse 28 of Acts 20, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd. The King James says to feed. The word shepherd there is the verb form of the word pastor. Pastor is a noun, um, and here's the verb form of it there. So if you're going to pastor a church, you're going to shepherd the church. But to whom did he speak that? Men that are called the elders? And men that are called the bishops or the overseers. If you go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, Peter also addresses that. I don't know if I put these up here. Yes, I did. I'm just jumping ahead. Uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. He said, The elders who among you I exhort, whom a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He said, And also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Now, notice that. He's called them elders. Now he tells them to do what? Shepherd or pastor the church. And then he says, which is among you serving as overseers. That's the same word for bishop. So when you start looking at what the scriptures teach, and I could go ahead and emphasize that if you want to see them given carefully, you can look to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, and when he talks about to the church there at Philippi with the elders and deacons. So he, he's put those together. And uh, you have their qualifications given. I'm not going to spend, I've got so much to cover, so I'm not going to spend time going over the qualifications. But in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, he said, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, an overseer, he desires a good work. And then he says a bishop must then be, and he gives all of the qualifications. When you go to Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, he also gives those same qualifications, stated a little differently, but perfectly in harmony with what he wrote to Titus or to Timothy. And uh, particularly at the end here, you notice in verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort and to convict those who contradict. If you'll notice there, their job is to guard, to shepherd, and to protect the flock of God. And if you have somebody comes in and they're creating controversy, they're creating by teaching things they are not, it's their job to, as he said, whose mouths must be stopped and to stop them. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, he gives qualifications for deacons. And those, again, are like the qualifications for elders. That indicates that you're talking about offices. And so, 
when you look at this, I think it's important for us to emphasize that men do not take any of these offices for themselves. These are offices that people have to be uh, prepared for and follow qualifications for it. If you'll notice, Acts chapter 1, verses 20 through 26, when it comes time to replace Judas, if you'll notice what it says, verse 23, or from 22, beginning from the baptism of John to the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become with a witness with us of his resurrection. First qualification of the next uh, apostle was going to be what? He had to be a witness. How important is that? Because the qualification for an apostle was you were going to be a witness for Jesus wherever you go. And so you had to be that. Number two, it said they proposed to Joseph called Barsabas, who's surnamed Justice, Matthias, and they prayed and said, Lord, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. And it's important to realize that they didn't choose, they didn't go and vote on Matthias versus Barsabas. Uh, they depended upon the Lord. And just like Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 4 says, and no man takes this honor to himself, but he who was called by God just as Aaron was. These people have to have the qualifications. And if you'll remember Acts 20 verse 28, he said, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. Do you hear that? Among which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. Now, how did he do that? He provided the qualifications that tells you who can serve in that capacity. When God specifies a man, we cannot change God's plan. Now, let's talk about salvation. If somebody came and asked the question, what must I do to be saved? Uh, there's some real good study here. I would love to just, just slow down and go through all this, but you're going to get most of this as we go through. But that question has been answered differently by a lot of people. And when you go to Acts 17, verse 30, the Philippian jailer came out, and of course I'd skipped over that. Acts 17, verses 30 and 31 is talking about, I'm looking back to Acts 16, sorry. He brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And you know what he was told? Believe on the Lord Jesus with all your house. You'll be saved. How important was it to have faith? Why didn't he go ahead and tell him everything to do? You got to believe first. You remember what uh, Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, but without faith it's impossible to please him? If you don't have faith... You know, anything else is not going to work. You remember the way Jesus phrased Mark 16, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he who believes not, why didn't he say, and is baptized not? If, if you don't believe, baptism means nothing. So that was irrelevant to bring up a subsequent thing. If you, if you can't get past faith, you can't, you can't go any further than that. Now, uh, what you have is the people on the day of Pentecost asking the same question. You go to Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I'm going to suggest to you that when we start looking at some of these churches, there's going to be the response is, there's nothing you can do. Uh... If you follow the Reformation movement, you'll notice that one of the first men who was uh, a leader in that Reformation movement was a man not only by Martin Luther, but a man by the name of John Calvin. And Calvin's doctrine has been boiled down into five points, and we're going to look at that shortly. But uh, if you truly believe in all points to the five points of it, you don't believe there's anything you can do. Nothing that you can do. The eunuch also asked for help as well. Acts 8, verse 30. Philip ran to him, heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah, and he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? Someone comes along and shows me what I need to do. 
That question has been asked numerous times, but no one was ever told to say a sinner's prayer. Do you remember the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, Acts 9, Acts 22? When Paul was on that road to Damascus, that light shone, he says, go into the city and it will be told you what you must do. Now, he goes there, he doesn't eat or drink anything for three days, and he's praying that whole time. That's what the Lord told Ananias. Behold, he's praying. When Ananias arrives, he says, okay, Paul, say the sinner's prayer with me. Now, what he said, he said, and why are you waiting? Why tarry us out? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So your answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? And somebody said, but you go back to Acts 16, and he tells the eunuch there, or not the eunuch, the jailer, he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. But he hadn't taught him yet. He takes him to his house, and you know what takes place with Paul there when he takes him to his house? They're all baptized. That same evening, you see, after he was taught, he did what he was supposed to do. No one was saved by simply being sincere or living a pretty good life. Uh, some people have this idea that you balance good works versus bad works, and if I have more good than bad, then I get to go to heaven. That's a works-based salvation. And I will tell you that uh, part of the Reformation movement was based on this idea that as long as you kept these rules, you got to go to heaven regardless of what was in your heart. Okay, once having obeyed the gospel, and that is a scriptural phrase, Romans 10 and verse 16 says, but they have not all obeyed. And then 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8 talks about those who have not obeyed the gospel. Uh, a person is then to remain faithful to the Lord. Uh, I'll emphasize there in verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 8 of 2 Thessalonians, he says, those who do not obey the gospel, that means there's something that I have to do. And after I've done that, then I've got to live faithfully. But if I don't live faithfully, I can lose my salvation. Galatians 5 and verse 4 says, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. But I think the best passage to use is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 39. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Now listen, after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back into perdition. You know what the word perdition means? D destruction. It the, literally means destroyed. He's going to lose his soul. He said, but those who have faith to the saving of the soul. Salvation is not based in our works, but based in grace. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. And then in Titus 3 and verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Now let's talk about worship for just a little bit. When it comes to the time to worship God, many underestimate the importance and seriousness of how we worship God. And I'd suggest to you that worshiping God requires thoughtful intent to do what God has said to do. Jesus summarized it in speaking with the woman at the well in John 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him, not should, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, when I get to the Old Testament, I realize that there are some people who didn't do that. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire on it, put incense on it, 
and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Did God take seriously what Nadab and Abihu were doing? Yes. Did Nadab and Abihu take it seriously? He didn't, they didn't do what God had commanded them to do. When you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verses 5 through 13, um, I'm just going to uh, take a little bit of this. David gathers everybody together, and they're going to go up to the city of Kareth, Jerem, and they're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. David is so enthusiastic about that. He's just got that in his heart. That's what he wants to do. And what we learn is there's two sons of Abinadab, Uzzah and Ahio, that are driving the cart. They put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart. What happens is the uh, Ark stumbles, and when it happens, then the start, Ark starts to tumble over, and Uzzah reaches out his hand and touches the Ark. You know what happens to him? He dies right there. Now, that just shocked David that that happened. But if you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 13, when it comes time now to bring it to Jerusalem, David said, we're going to do it the right way this time. We're going to have the, the priest, they're going to put those poles and those rings on each side, we're going to put it on our shoulders, and we're going to take it in Jerusalem the right way. And he said, "For you, because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. We didn't do it the way God told us to do it. We did it the way we wanted to do it. Does that describe to you the seriousness of when we worship about doing it the way God told us to do it? And somebody said, but it won't hurt to do a little bit more or a little bit less or a little bit different. Oh, it will. Well, if we start deciding that, that's where it comes from. And so in Matthew 15 and verse 9, in the context of people binding their traditions about how to worship God, Jesus says, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When you and I worship God as men have directed, then what we're doing is our worship is vain before God, and he does not accept it. That's what it means to have vain worship. What did the early church do in worship as directed by the apostles and the prophets? Those who had a direct revelation, those who had, remember what Paul, uh, or not, what Paul, the apostles were told by Jesus in John chapters 14 through 16. He said, he will guide you into all truth. In other words, everything Jesus had taught them would be reminded to them. They would have that. They would know exactly what to do. The prophets also would be able to tell people what God wanted to be done. Well, Here's what we know they did. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, Paul says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. You'll notice specifically he says, speaking to one another. What does that indicate when you say speaking? It's a vocal music of words. It's not just making noise. It's words. And the type of songs are psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That's the reason why we don't sing patriotic songs in the worship. Then chapter 3, verse 16 of Colossians, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Do you know what common factor you have between those two verses? Singing. It's vocal music, but there's something else here. He says here, teaching and admonishing one another. That's called reciprocal. You do it for me, and I'll do it for you. That's where singing, we, we all participate. This is a command to the congregation. We don't have a choir sing for us. We don't have a, a quartet up in front of us. We all sing because it's our all of our obligation to teach and to admonish one another and to do so with grace in our hearts to the Lord. They also prayed. And uh, their prayers were described in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He says, 
I desire, exhort first of all, that uh, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So he's talking about what should be in included in our prayers and you can say supplications prayers and intercessions we could spend a lot of time on uh, unpacking that but uh, let me go on to verse 8 because he says i desire therefore that the men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting there the word men is not the word mankind but is the word male and it refers specifically to the male now, does, do women pray? Absolutely women pray. But women do not pray in a mixed assembly. They do not pray in the presence of men. And so he said, I desire, therefore, that the men pray. Now, what happens if we say, okay, we're going to become one of these, they call them today, egalitarian churches, where you say, okay, well, anything that a man can do, a woman can do. And you put a woman in front of the audience to pray. You're not following what the scriptures has taught us. Lifting up holy hands. I think it's obvious, you know, when you go back to the Old Testament, when he talks about uh, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, uh, is, it's sort of a figure of speech for somebody who's holy rather than someone who's unholy. You know, you don't want to put a person... Uh, I knew of a congregation where the men of the congregation were just disgusted because they had people waiting on the table who were still intoxicated from the previous Saturday night. That's not a holy hands. Those are people who are uh, sinning, and you don't want to put them in front of the congregation. Next thing, they taught the Word of God. You'll see in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, Paul assembling with the church there at Troas, and he says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread... Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message till midnight. That's preaching that took place. Acts 2, verse 42, and uh, they continued steadfastly in the apostles of doctrine, uh, breaking of bread and prayers, fellowship breaking of bread and prayers. So uh, the teaching of doctrine was definitely a part of the early New Testament worship. They partook of the Lord's Supper as well. Uh, quite frequently on Sunday morning when we're preparing to partake of the Lord's Supper, various ones will get up and say, uh, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 20 through 26. I know it's too small to read on the screen, but you've heard it so much, you know what it says. Paul said, therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, and each one takes his own supper ahead of the others, and one is hungry and the other is drunk. What do you have, not have houses to eat and drink in? They had taken the Lord's Supper, and they'd made it like a common meal. And he said, that's not right. He said, what it's meant for is to remember the Lord's body and blood. And he goes on to say that you should do this in remembrance of me in quoting what Jesus had said. And then they gave to the work of the Lord's church. Uh, the work had to continue. We see giving at the very beginning of the church. For instance, when the uh, early church met together and those people who had need, what did they do? They took care of that need. Acts 11, verse 26 says they came, or Acts 11, I believe it's verse 30, so they came and placed it at the elders' feet. So you have the direction of how this was done. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week. Let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. The big picture in all of this is, is that the early church had a worship that involved singing, praying, studying God's Word, partaking the Lord's Supper, and giving. And uh, we don't see a lot of other stuff in there. We don't see the, the kissing of icons. Uh, and you can say, well, who does that? That's the Eastern Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. but 
But he's talking about the Lord's Supper there. He's talking about their abuse of the Lord's Supper there. Um, now here's, I've got about one minute. They're fixing to come ring the bell. I don't know how long it's going to last <laughs> because I've taken two weeks to do one lesson. And uh, Lord willing, next Sunday or Wednesday evening, we're going to talk about the Baptist. And uh, we'll try to unpack 61 different groups. There's 61 different groups call themselves Baptist. We'll probably only consider about three or four of them, which are the major ones. But uh, then we'll talk about the Catholics. I moved them up because I think they uh, need to be discussed. And then we'll cover some of these others. If you've got some suggestions or some preferences, let me know, and I'll try to maybe shuffle the list just a little bit. I didn't cover as much as I wanted to tonight because I really wasn't done with lesson one. <laughs> okay, we'll pick up there next week. Good evening. It's about time to start our Wednesday evening devotional. I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. Thank you for coming out to our meeting here at Church of Christ at Bobby Branch on a Wednesday night. If you're visiting with, with us tonight, we're especially glad that you've come our way, and please come back at any and every opportunity you might have. At this time, if you'd like to take out your songbook and mark the invitation song for after the lesson, the invitation song will be number 771, 771. And once you've found that, you can mark our first song of the evening, number 990-990 will be our first song. Once you've marked those, if you'd like to mark in your Bible, the scripture reading for Brother Willie's lesson tonight will be taken from the book of Acts, 
Acts chapter 26, verse 28. Acts 26 through 20, or Acts 26, verse 28. I'd like to make you aware of just a few announcements and reminders now. These are all things that are found in the bulletin, but I'll, I'll read a few of them here as I've got them. Some area events that are coming up, a gospel singing will be held at the Old Philadelphia Meeting House on October the 4th. Mount Leo will be hosting a singing downtown on October the 12th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Grange Hall will be having a gospel meeting beginning on October 13th, running through the October the 16th with Brother Tony preaching. And there will be a ladies' day at West Riverside on October 29th with Lori Boyd at 9 o'clock. Some other events also found in the bulletin this Sunday here at Bobby Branch will be the first Bible Bowl of the season, and it will be covering the book of Acts, chapters 13 through 15. The Autumn Street Fair is this Saturday. Please sign up if you can help with that. And the Senior Saints will be making a trip to Muddy Pond on October the 8th. There's also a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board if you're interested in that activity. Some youth events that are also in the bulletin. On the 6th, which is this Sunday, as I mentioned, the Bible Bowl will be here at Bobby Branch. That Sunday evening, Sunday night eats. On October 20th, Hay will be here also at Bobby Branch for, for that Hay program. And the October 25th, 26th, and 27th will be the Erupt Youth Rally. And October 30th will be Birthday Wednesday um, for the youth. But some of those events are open to all to come and participate. The sick that we know of. Thank you, dear God, for the day of life. We thank you for your love, your compassion, your care, and your providence. We thank you that we live in a country where freedom abounds, though often restricted by men of evil. We pray, Father, that you would help us to, re to right our country to help point it in the right direction, the correct direction, based upon the standards that are given to us in, our, in your word, the Bible that we use. We pray for strength to endure, to stand fast, to be dedicated, loyal, and spokesmen for the things that you have taught us that are right. We thank you for the leaders of the world that are dedicated to doing the right thing. We're thankful for the leaders of your church that also work together and love each other and serve 
admonish, exhort, uh, and uplift us that we might remain in that straight and narrow way that leads to heaven. We pray tonight for forgiveness of our sin. We pray that you would look into our hearts and know, Father, that we understand that we have done wrong and will maybe do wrong again. But we hope that you see and we pray that you see the remorse that we have for the things we have done that are against your word. Help us to always look into ourselves every day at every opportunity. And let us examine the things that we do that we might determine they are right or wrong. And as the weakness of the flesh falls upon us, be with us, be patient with us, correct us when necessary, and point us in the right direction. Tonight, we're thankful that we've had the opportunity to come together to study, to learn more about the church as it was established, the church as it grew, <clears throat> and the church as it endured the hardships that the world places upon it. Help us to take those learnings and understand that we are the anchors of the church and that we have the obligation to hold it together, keep it aright, and to help point it in a direction that others can see in our lives, in our, in our tongues, in our conversations, in the things we do when we think no one is looking to know that we are truly Christians. Tonight, as we hear words again from the speaker of this hour, help us to consider them, help us to apply them to our life, and make us stronger in your service. For those who are sick, we also pray tonight that you would be with those that care for them that you would help them to love and care for them in a way as if they were family, to help those caregivers look for the right and best thing to be done for the condition that exists. Be with us as we continue tonight. Take us safely home. Give us a night of rest. May our eyes open tomorrow to see the sun that you created that warms our days and leads us through life. For this prayer we ask in Christ's most holy name. And amen. Tonight's reading will be taken from Acts chapter 26, verse 28. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Have you ever done anything that you regretted? Regret is something that we could probably have at any age, as long as we have understanding. But what is a regret? It's an emotion. It's a feeling. It's a sense of loss, a sense of remorse, a sense of an act that we have done that was not correct. But what is bad about regret? But the element that's bad about regret is that regret has a negative consequence. Imagine that, if you will, with me, looking back at history. Let's think about the rich man and Lazarus. We all know that story well. But can you imagine the regret that that rich man although while alive, lived sumptuously every day, having anything that his heart's desired. And yet, in torments, he looks up and he sees Lazarus being comforted in Abraham's bosom and longed for Lazarus to just come and, and touch the tip of his tongue with a drop of water that he might have some relief. Great regret. 
We might also consider the people of the Sodom, of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, people who lived a horrifically immoral life. Um, at one point part in the scripture, it talks about a filthy life. And the irony of it that God is sending his angels to bring Lot and his family out, and he's going to destroy that city. And these wicked men are wanting to commit immoral acts with these angels that are about to destroy them. Can you imagine the regret that they have when they also find themselves in torments, having their cities been destroyed, and now they're suffering the same fate as the rich man? Let's consider the days of Noah. And God spoke in Genesis that the thought and the intent of man's heart was only evil continually. And there you have Noah. And Peter calls him a preacher of righteousness. Not necessarily, although he would have been this too, a righteous preacher, but rather a preacher of righteousness. He was trying to proclaim to the people what God's plan was for them that they could be right in the sight of God. And yet, of course, God brings the flood. And all those in that, in that day also find themselves in torments with the rich man and the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Of course, they were there before they were. They were the first that we recorded of. Well, now I want you to imagine you having neglected so great a salvation, having not obeyed the gospel, that you also find yourself in the same place of torments with these people we just talked about. We don't want that for you. God does not want that for you. Today is the day of salvation. We know that Paul, uh, talking to Agrippa and telling Agrippa that I know that you believe the prophets. You know about the things that I'm talking about, the things that preached Christ, and the things that I am teaching now. And yet we have no record that Agrippa ever obeyed the gospel. How great is his regret? We do not want that regret for you. Rather, we want you to be able to rejoice if death should come your way, you find yourself in paradise with Lazarus. If Jesus should come back again, you'll find that your name is written in the book of life and there'll be great rejoicing. So tonight, if we can encourage you, we want you to respond to the Lord's invitation as together we stand and we sing.
us bow. Our God and Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We thank you for this worship service. May we have done everything in your sight and forgive us if we have not. Please go with us, guide, guard, and direct us, and please forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.